All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Duke Media Briefing on Electric Vehicles. I'm Amanda Soliday with Duke University Communications in Durham, North Carolina. For those of you expecting Greg Phillips as moderator, I assure you we still have lots to dig into here. So we're seeing more electric vehicles on the road and that requires new infrastructure. For electric vehicles, that means more charging stations and a grid to support them. To get started, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Tim Johnson is a professor in the Nicholas School of the Environment. He studies energy systems planning with a focus on environmental quality and energy consumption. Jen Weiss is a senior, senior policy associate at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Quality, or excuse me, I always, I always stumble over that. Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. She authored the North Carolina Energy Efficiency Roadmap, a guide developed in partnership with the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality to help the state be more efficient with its energy use. First, we have a couple opening questions and afterwards there'll be time for Q&A. So let's start with you, Tim Johnson. And uh, I think we can start broad. What infrastructure is required to support electric vehicles in the US? Thank you, Amanda. Um, and thanks to all, the, all those of you who are joining us this morning. Infrastructure, well, the, the thing we think about most would be charging stations for light duty or private vehicles, you know, the vehicles that we use to get around for, you know, in our daily lives. And that's certainly true. Um, <clears throat> building out, you know, charging networks. You know, right now, for the people who own electric vehicles, and you know, you can argue whether they're representative of the general population, but most charging takes place at home. But these are also wealthier people who tend to live in single-family homes with garages or at least driveways, um, and they have access to, you know, a, you know, a, a place where they can install a charging unit. Um, that's not necessarily true when you start thinking about people who live in multi-family uh, dwelling units who you know have on-street parking. Um, and so building out a charging network um, and then also a public charge, building up the public charging network as well. But that's still all light duty vehicles. Um, the other piece of the puzzle that's getting more and more attention is charging for heavy duty vehicles. In other words, freight vehicles, larger fleet vehicles, buses, you know, garbage trucks, delivery uh, vehicles, you know, that, that runs the gamut. So we're really you know, broadening our, our thinking about the type of infrastructure that's needed for electric vehicle charging. Great, thank you. Jen Weiss, where do you think the most effort should be focused on right now to encourage electric vehicle use in North Carolina? Oh, sure. So um, yeah, thank you again for everybody for joining today. Um, this is a pleasure to, uh, to talk with you all with my buddy, Tim. Um, so Tim set that up really well. Um, so I think, yeah, like Tim alluded to, there's like two, two different markets and, and I guess two different pathways for the strategies to be developed. On the light duty side, the cars and the trucks, I think what's most important right now is to be focused on developing that coordinated network between all the different parties that are interested in investing in um, EV infrastructure. So that can be utilities, that could be state and local governments, that could be third party providers, but making sure that they're all coordinating and working together so that we build out a complete network to get the, um, the end user where they want to go. And so in doing that, I think one of the most important things that I think about is to build it where the customers are today, not where they're going, but where they are today. So that can include your house or, or your, your workplace, but it can also include places Places like shopping centers and um, grocery stores and hospitals and, and other places that people are going. So on the light duty side, um, just that coordination between all those different groups is going to be paramount. And I should not leave out here, and we can dig into this a little bit later, but um, rural areas. They're not always on the radar when we're building out investment because they're not on the main corridors and the main highways, but it's so important to build out the infrastructure in our rural areas so that we can get people where they need to go. Um, and then on the second side of that, the, uh, the heavy duty, as, as Tim was talking about, um, that takes a lot more power and that takes a lot more infrastructure to power these huge trucks and these emergency vehicles. And so we need to be strategically thinking about and working in partnership with utilities to figure out what that means to the grid, um, how we back those up, especially for emergency vehicles. How do we back up emergency vehicles, either with a microgrid, storage, um, to be able to, in the event of a storm, be able to power those as well. And so I think a lot of the strategy needs to be developed in, in two separate ways for the two separate groups, but it needs to be coordinated and all the groups need to be talking about it together. Great, thank you, Jen. You touched on some of our advanced questions already, so that's wonderful. 
Um, we'll be taking questions now and thank you to everyone who submitted questions in advance. Um, we'll start with those. At any time you can post questions via the Q&A window. And if you would like to ask your question in person, you can just raise your hand in Zoom. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. And thanks to everyone watching on YouTube. So here's one of our advanced questions. Um, Jen, we'll start with you. One concern from potential car buyers has to do with range anxiety. So where to charge your car and how long it will take if you need to stop. What is the current situation here and how might that change with Biden's infrastructure plan? Yeah, that is a great question. And so as a LEAF owner, um, when I first bought my LEAF, I, was my biggest concern was range anxiety. And I think I stopped using my car around 40, when there was 40 miles left, just because I wanted to make sure I was charged. Um, that has been gotten better. But, but one of the reasons I was talking about building out this coordinated network is um, to reduce the amount of range anxiety, give the end user the comfort and the, um, the feeling that they are gonna be able to charge wherever they need to, just like we can go to a gas station today. And so I've seen a lot of talk around building um, the radiuses between building the different infrastructure, and it can be between 10 to 20 miles between different charging stations. But again, I'm going to go back to making sure that the stations are where the user is. So if they're going to a workplace every day, make sure there are chargers at that workplace. Um, that'll reduce the anxiety of getting to work and back. If they're going to the grocery store, if they're going to a restaurant or going to a, a, a doctor, just make sure that we are put, placing it where they are. So while they are doing the other things they need to do in their life, they are able to charge their car back up and get over that range anxiety piece of it. Great, thank you. Um, so a follow-up question for both panelists, uh, and Jen, Jen, you already touched on this. How close are we to getting good coverage with charging stations in rural areas and more rural states? I could start, but I'd love to hear Tim's thoughts too. So um, we right now have seen um, the infrastructure going in on these main corridors. And these are the major highways in North Carolina. It's, it's I-95 and 85 and 40. Um, but there's been more talk about, especially in tourist areas of building out infrastructure. So along our coast in North Carolina um, or in the mountains and building out the infrastructure so that people can travel there. What we're not seeing as much of and, and what I'd love to see more investment into is the small cities and towns throughout the state and throughout any rural area um, that is not getting the attention because until we can do that, um, we are not gonna get um, the, the, the mass acceptance of EVs that we want to get to. Yeah, and I agree uh, with you, Jen. Um, that, you know, I don't have a whole lot to add there. Um, you know, one of the things that you need to keep in mind is how much people drive as well. You know, the, the average trip distance, or if you want to look at the average uh, number of miles, you know, the typical, say, American household drives in a day, um, is well within the range of most electric vehicles. Um, so if you are, say, charging at night, you know, it, it's, it's a different mentality, but you're fine. You, you're going to be able to get by. Um, advances in battery technology, we could talk about that later, will help with this somewhat. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, I, guess I don't have much more to add beyond what uh, we, we, you know, Jen supplied. Great, thank you. We, we actually have a related question in the Q&A or somewhat related question. So from Dominic uh, Roosh, Ford launches the F-150 Lightning today, the electric version of the U.S.'s best-selling vehicle. How significant of a move is, is this? Do you want me to go since I mentioned it earlier? I think it's huge. Um, you, when you consider you know, how many people drive the F-150s and you see them every day on the road, to launch a vehicle like that and to start a marketing campaign around it and to start to transition people to that, I think is, is going to be huge for the industry. I agree. You know, um, Ford, again, using the F-150, um, but a few years ago now, uh, redesigned it um, using a fair amount of aluminum, you know, lighter weight materials. And that was a big deal at the time as well. Um, and you know, so this is a, a mainstream, you know, <laughs> all American vehicle, you know, it's the pickup truck, um, iconic. And, you know, starting there, you know, normalizing it, this isn't a, you know, a, a wasn't designed as an electric vehicle. Um, you know, I think that that'll help, you know, you know, with acceptance, just normalizing, you know, the, again, the idea that, these things can be electric and hey, they perform pretty well when they are. Yeah, Tim, so um, I, another question related to the F-150. Um, you know, there are these photos yesterday of the president uh, test driving one. 
how how much do you feel political will has changed uh let's say in the last decade towards electric vehicles at a federal and state level um I certainly there is a lot of interest in electric vehicles on the fleet side. So, um, you know, where do you, where would you expect to see, you know, electric vehicles replacing their, you know, either gasoline or diesel counterparts first? Well, you know, you're starting to see it with fleets, transit buses, for instance. Um, why? Well, they're more expensive to buy, but they're a whole lot cheaper to operate in the long run. The fuel costs are, are lower, but the maintenance costs are a lot lower. And so there's, you know, just from a kind of an economic standpoint, there's, you know, growing interest um, in electric vehicles that way. Um, but, you know, they, they're going to get, electric vehicles are going to kicked around just like masks have been, you know, in the political process. They're going to become a symbol, or they are a symbol, um, unfortunately. Um, my hope is that with EVs, you know, if, if people, you know, um, whether they are, in, you, know, you know, individuals or, you know, fleet managers, you know, become familiar with these things, you know, realize the benefits of them, uh, driving them, owning them, that, you know, some of that, you know, that, that uh, political baggage will, will uh, drop. Yeah, I agree. And I'll just add on to, I think over the last 10 years, we've seen a shift in the um, understanding of how much economic development the electric vehicles can bring, especially here in the Southeast. We've seen a lot of manufacturers, auto manufacturers start to either switch over entire plants to have um, an electric vehicles or at least partially switch over. And then you have the auto suppliers that come along with it. And so from a political perspective to the states down, especially in the Southeast, that's really important, right? We wanna be building that, we wanna have the economic development. And at the same time, we wanna be training our workers to be able to work with electric vehicles. So the jobs are gonna be increasing in that area. And I think that's also a very important component that we're all getting our arms around and realizing. Great, thank you. Um, this is somewhat of a basic sort of a table setting question. Uh, who regulates charging stations? Who can own them? Where are they popping up? Um, if if uh, you could speak to that. Let's start with you, Jennifer. Well, this, I'm smiling because Tim and I just had a master's student that just wrote a paper on this. So um, oh, cool. this is really a very timely, who planted this question for us? No, <laughs> so. It depends, and I hate to say that answer, but it depends. Um, so right now we're seeing, I think her paper outlined um, 30 states which will let um, third party providers um, provide the charging of the electricity without having to be regulated as a utility. Um, but in other states, um, you are required to be regulated by the Utilities Commission if you sell electricity. And so we're seeing a little bit of shift with some of the states to um, put exemptions in for electric vehicles, uh, but that hasn't happened across the board. Um, the other piece to that, though, is um, we don't have a similar counterpoint part to the, um, the fuel industry, which has re regulations on metrics and measuring and, and maintenance um, for all of our fuel stations. We don't have that today in the electric vehicle space. So that is definitely something that needs attention and that the policymakers should be discussing. Mm, that's interesting. Um, let's see. We have a great question from Liana Norman. Are there any companies attempting to make charging parks enjoyable or capitalize on the uh, consumer's time spent while charging? Well, I, I can tell you um, owners of uh, gasoline stations or fueling stations are certainly interested, you know, in what this means for their business. Um, uh, and, you know, it, right now, you know, that they, they make most of their money from selling, can, you know, whatever you sell in a convenience store, um, whether it be snacks or other things, um, rather than gasoline. So, you know, with, with the switch to electricity, what does it mean for them? And so I think there's a lot of Kind of innovative thinking about how you attract people there. Um, you know, it, it's how we make it fun. Um, you know, I, you know, most public charging, I think it, if it's just, you know, you know, workplace charging, you know, it's, just, it's sort of utilitarian. Um, I think where, you know, you may see more of an opportunity for fun is, you know, with, you know, fast charging, you, you know, you're, you're trying to attract, uh, you know, EV owners who are traveling longer distances and need a, you know, fairly quick charge to get back on the road. And yet it's still going to take 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Um, you know, the, you know, having a, you know, the, the restaurant pairing with an EV charger makes sense there. Um, but, uh, you know, other, other amenities, you know, I'm not sure. Jan, have you anything come to mind? 
Well, the one that immediately jumps to mind is a story I heard about, and I'm not going to say who the um, retailer is, but a certain retailer that 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 knows from data that you know based on how long a customer stays in their store, they'll spend X amount of dollars extra. And so these retailers are excited to install charging equipment because the longer that someone has to stay there to charge, the longer they're going to wander through their store and hopefully buy more. So if you consider shopping fun, then I think that's a, that's a fun that's a fun way to uh, spend your your time. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, this is this is another um, somewhat basic question, and I'm sure it varies. But how about how much does it cost to charge up an electric vehicle? Like, say, say there's no charge and you need full charge. What's the range and cost? Ooh, that's an interesting question. So yeah. it depends on where you charge. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you know a lot of our local governments um, and some some states have put in free chargers, and so to to the the user, that's not going to cost them anything. Um, if you're charging at home, um, it will be whatever your rate is, uh, your electricity rate um, times. I think if they charge at uh, what is it four kilowatt hours uh, or for one, I, I don't know, one gallon. I don't, there was an equivalent there. Tim might, Tim might know what that is. And so it's gonna depend on that, but there's also time of use rates for that too. And you can charge at different times of the day and get a lower rate. So that's a really hard question to answer. It, it is a hard question to answer. You know, some retailers, uh, the, I know the real retailer Jen was alluding to, and they're you know, giving away charging um, just because they've done the calculation. They know, you know how much their sales will go up if they have people hang around for a little while. Um, but you know, otherwise, you know, if, if you are charging at home, you know, it really is the the whatever the the electricity rate your your uh, utility is charging you to you know uh, provide electricity to your charger. However, with public charging, you know, now the owners or with um well with publicly accessible charging, if it's privately owned, the owners of that charging infrastructure need to recover their fixed costs, and those aren't cheap to put in a you know a charger. Um, you know, especially in a public location, when you factor in all the soft costs, the permitting, um, the interconnection costs, you know, the, the grid, um, you know, that sort of thing, um, it can really increase the cost of, of public charging. And so if you're trying to recover your cost as a business, um, you know, it, it can go up. If you're just doing it this home at home again, you know, you're going to pay the fixed cost to put in a maybe a level two charger in a garage or along a driveway. Um, but you don't factor that into your mental accounting. It, um, you're just looking at the variable cost of paying for electricity. And in that sense, it's much lower, but it's, it's gonna be lower than gasoline. Gasoline prices have to be very cheap or electricity prices have to be very high um, before on a per mile basis, it's gonna cost you more to charge an electric vehicle than it is to tank up a, a, you know, a gasoline vehicle. Interesting. Tim, you mentioned a level two charger. So it sounds like there are different types of chargers. And I, I've read that Tesla has its own proprietary system. Could you talk a little bit about that as well? Sure. We think about really three different types of chargers. Um, the most basic is what's known as a level one. Um, and that's a standard wall outlet, you know, 120 volt household outlet. Um, because the voltage is low, because of constraints on the, the current that household wiring can support, the power that you can draw to, you know, is relatively low. And therefore, um, using a level one charger, it takes a long time to charge even a moderately sized battery. So most people who are serious about EVs put in what's known as a level two charger, which operates at a higher voltage level. Um, most public chargers are also level two. So if you are you know, charging at work, charging at a retail store, um, even a lot, some of the on-street charging when you see that is level two. Um, runs at a slightly higher voltage, higher current, therefore the power output's greater. You can charge, well, certainly faster than you can off a wall outlet. Fast charging, um, <clears throat> Uh, also known as direct current fast charging are you know, uh, chargers that run at a much, much higher power level. In other words, you know, power is the, the rate of energy transfer, if you think of that, how much, how quickly you're putting you know, energy into a, a battery. Um, and so they, they run at a, a, you know, a, a power output that is you know, an order of magnitude higher than say a level two charger. Um, those level, you know, the, the fast chargers are you know, relatively you know, few you know, in number compared to, you know, even publicly available level two chargers. Um, it's not something you would put in a home. Um, it would really tax your, your, your wiring and you probably wouldn't need it. 
Um, but these are you know the chargers that are there, um, at least when we think about light duty vehicles, you know, for people who are doing long distance hauls or who just don't have the time, you know, to wait to 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 charge. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions from Judith Ratana. Um, she wanted to know what percentage of cars would you like to see be electric and what's a realistic timeline to get there? Uh, Jen, let's start with you. Oh no, I was hoping that was gonna start with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so the, the research that I'm seeing and also what we're seeing coming out of, um, of President Biden's office administration is um, I think all new car sales by 2035 um, and then um, all cars switched over by 2050. So the question there is, do I think that's possible? Um, I, I, I do believe with the right infrastructure in place that we can get there, um, but I think it's going to take a lot of um, education. It's going to take a lot of um, work with the different um, the different types. We mentioned the light duty, heavy duty, medium duty. Working with all of those different types of vehicles to make sure that they are um, able to charge when they need to, and that they there's resiliency measures for for backup. So. Um, so I don't have a good timing for, for, for the percentages, but I, I do think that as we continue to, um, yeah, to, to educate and to have people drive these cars, um, we're going to see the numbers increase um, over time. Yeah, um, you know, just building on that a little bit. Right now, it's about 5% of global um, light duty vehicle sales are electric vehicles. In the U.S., it's lower. Um, China, it's much higher. You know, China is kind of out ahead of, you know, uh, many other, most other countries on this. Um, there are other European countries that are as well. Um, recently, as in like yesterday, um, the International Energy uh, Agency, the IEA, um, put out a fairly major report looking at what it would take to really decarbonize the energy system. Um, and they call for 60 percent of new vehicle sales to be all electric by 2030. So in other words, in not, you know, not, not even nine years now, um, with 100 percent of all new vehicle sales being uh, you know, electric by 2035. Um, that's consistent with what states like California have put forward. Um, you know, manufacturers like General Motors, GM, have said that they will be you know, switching to all electric platforms by 2035. Um, it's ambitious, though. You know, it, it's certainly an aspirational target. Um, you know, could we do it? Well, if you're talking about just new vehicle sales, you know, that's different from the on-road fleet. But new vehicle sales, probably. Um, it, you know, we could talk about what it would take in terms of battery manufacturing capacity, how quickly that would have to ramp up. You know, the charger build out certainly. Um, and it also again depends on you're just talking about light duty vehicles, heavy duty vehicles as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it, and again, that's just vehicle sales, not the on-road fleet. The average car, at least in the U.S., you know, stays on the road for, oh, I want to say it's like, you know, close to 14 years now. Um, and, you know, you, you need incentives to get older vehicles off the road if you want to increase the share of the fleet that is all electric, you know, on a similar time frame. I saw in the infrastructure plan, uh, for example, the president has pledged to electrify at least 20% of yellow school buses. Um, have you seen any other municipal or state efforts to do similar things to, to start with certain types of fleets? Jen, you want to talk about the Yeah, UW I can talk settlement? a little bit. So um, especially here in North Carolina, uh, we have seen um, the VW settlement, the funds that came out of the, um, the settlement with VW um, because of some diesel um, things that happened in the past. Um, but but the, they've in, um, installed, installed, they've invested in um, a few school buses here, and I think they want to do more with the next tranches. The other thing that's happening is the utilities, Duke Energy here in North Carolina has started to um, do some pilot programs to invest in school buses. Um, and I think they have 30 in their, in their next, um, in their first round of this pilot to see how, what it will take to get these school buses out there. So we definitely have seen that states like Virginia have also implemented some programs to start to, to test out what school buses could do. And the interesting implications to this, and this is probably something Tim, more of Tim's um, vein than mine, is, is the vehicle to grid implications, especially of a school bus, because the school buses are only used for certain hours of the day. And the rest of the day, they can be used as batteries and they can be a 
acquiring power from solar or from others that we can use later in the day when we when the power demand is higher. And so I think what we're going to be seeing is a lot of testing out of how that works and what that could look like as a win-win situation, both for the utility and for the school district. Yeah. And I'll mention, right, I, mean, I could build on that, but I'll also mention, you know, there are other incentives for electrifying school buses. You know, um, diesel buses are, even if they, you know, they have decent emissions controls on them, they stay on the road or the, for a long time. Um, and, you know, you're, you know, these are, you know, uh, you know, children then who are being exposed to diesel exhaust. So electrifying buses, you know, school buses, um, you know, it's not just a energy and climate issue. Um, you know, there's a public health issue is there as well. Um, you know, as, as Jen mentioned, um, you know, there certainly is a lot of thinking about using school buses as a stationary grid storage resource. Um, you know, they're parked for most of the summer and a school bus would need a fairly decent sized battery and you have a lot of school buses parked. That's a lot of, you know, stationary battery storage that in theory could be available um, to be used, you know, uh, on the grid, you know, to store power um, when power is plentiful or cheap, um, especially when we're overproducing renewable energy from say solar um, and then have it available to discharge back into the grid um, at other times and for different purposes. Oh, that's interesting. We have a we have a few questions about the environmental um, implications of electric vehicles. So um, let's see, what's the best way to ask this? Um, so we know that use of electric vehicles reduces carbon emissions compared to gas powered vehicles. How much less carbon exactly, and and what might that mean for the environment? Yeah, so this is a very interesting, interesting question. Um, electric vehicles don't have a tailpipe. So you don't have combustion emissions, um, you know, at the, the point of use. Um, now, there are other emissions that are associated with vehicles, you know, tires wear down, brake pads wear. And so we talk about different pollutants from vehicles, you know, carbon dioxide is probably the one we're thinking about here most, but um, you know, other what are known as criteria pollutants that lead to things like urban smog, um, you know, carbon monoxide, and then particulate matter, you know, are, are the, the types of pollutants we usually think about with, with vehicles, particularly in urban areas. Um, well, without a tailpipe, again, you don't have combustion related emissions, but you do have particulate emissions from tire wear and, you know, uh, brake pad wear. So an electric vehicle, the particulate emissions um, are still significant. They're about half that of a, you know, you know gasoline vehicle. Um, so half is good, but, you know, it's still there. There's not emissions free in that, in that sense. But the question all turns on, you know, where do you, where does the power come from? You know, the, the electricity is being generated somewhere that's, you know, you know, that is being used to charge the batteries in these vehicles. Um, and that depends on a number of things. So, you know, it's, you know, if, if you, you know, were to you know, plug into a solar panel, we don't do it that way, but then you'd have emissions free, you know, power. You know, you have to ask, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's a complicated question, but if I were to if go plug an electric vehicle in to charge it, you know, someplace there is a power plant that's going to ramp up its output a little bit to meet that load. Um, and so that, you know, you have to ask, you know, what is, what is that plant, you know, what is it doing? Is it a fossil plant? Are we absorbing extra renewable energy? Um, you know, it, what will it be? And that depends on the time of day. It depends on the local grid and the, the, the mix of power plants on that grid. And it also depends on how you're charging. Getting back to our you know, brief discussion about different types of chargers, um, if you are you know, charging off a, say, a, a level one or level two you know, charger um, and you need to you know, fill your battery, you're going to do it overnight. It's going to take several hours at a fairly you know, low power level. Um, so you're going to get the electricity you need, but it's spread out over you know, several hours. Um, and so the impact on the grid isn't that significant. However, if you were to ch uh, charge off a fast charger um, and you were to, you know, you know, to top off your batteries, um, you know, transferring the same amount of electricity into your battery, you're doing it over a much shorter time. So the, the power demand increases proportionally that will show up on the grid uh, you know, in, in a different way. Um, and 
So again, you know, the, the question about emissions is interesting. You know, the, the, the U.S. grid now in most places is clean enough that on a per mile basis, even your CO2 emissions are going to be lower with electric vehicle than you know, a gasoline car would be. Um, however, you know, again, it, it really depends on what happens behind the scenes when you, you know, plug in your vehicle. Hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add, Amanda, if I can, just one thing, because um, Tim talked about the emissions um, and, and carbon certainly is, is one of the emissions we want to reduce, but there's been a lot of work done um, in California and a couple other states about NOx emissions, uh, which have huge health implications, particularly around areas of concentration, like where, warehouse districts or um, uh, industrial areas or ports where there's a lot of um, heavy duty trucks coming in and out all of the time. And so um, what we're seeing also is a lot of work being done to reduce those NOx emissions, which will help with, with um, improving health in those areas. Oh, well, that's interesting. So uh, NOx is nitrogen oxide. Nit nitrous oxide, you think? Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Um, so since we are just coming um, off the heels of a gas, a gas shortage, I have to ask what would happen if we had some sort of power outage, like major power outage and people were relying on electricity to charge their vehicles. So has this happened? How, how might we, we prevent um, some sort of disaster in that area? Well, you'd have to ask if gas stations would be able to run without power too. I mean, if they have a backup generator, then they could, but if there's a power outage, a gas station won't necessarily be able to run. So it's, you know, it, it works both ways. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I, maybe I'll turn it back to Jen, because she had brought up emergency vehicles. You know, it's not just personal vehicles, but if we were to, you know, electrify, you know, say municipal fleet vehicles, police cars, fire trucks, that sort of thing, or the types of, you know, you were thinking about a natural disaster, the other vehicles you need to get out on the road to do, you know, uh, utility line repair, to move trees, that sort of thing. Um, you know, if those were electrified, well, you know, then you have a, a, a bigger problem there as well. So Jen, you brought that up before. It, were you thinking about something along those lines? That's exactly what I was thinking. And, and what we're seeing is kind of this development of kind of a microgrid of, of solar power paired with a battery to be able to back up these emergency vehicles. Um, and it, that's exactly the reason why. If things go down, we want to make sure that our emergency vehicles can continue to operate. And so um, they'll develop their own little grid that has their own solar, their own battery to be able to power it in the event that, um, that the electric um, grid goes down. Completely island off so that it's not affected by those disruptions um, to the grid. Um, and the second thing I, I just will call attention to is on the light duty side, evacuation routes. Um, this is something we talk about a lot in the Southeast is how do you make sure that the chargers along evacuation routes are, are sufficiently powered in the event that the power goes down. So again, that's developing the solar, developing the batteries and specific strategic spots along these evalu evacuation routes, because we wanna make sure that everyone can get out if they need to get out. Great, we have a question from Liana Norman. Um, she was wondering about the incentives to invest in other battery suppliers that don't um, rely on lithium ion and cells and packs. And she said she's thinking about the environmental and geopolitical implications of mining lithium. Yes, so that's a really good question. Um, vehicle batteries, you know, electric vehicle batteries, um, you know, are, are almost exclusively lithium ion based now, you know, that's the, the traditional car battery is a lead acid battery. Um, the some of the early hybrids used a, a nickel metal hydride battery, but you know, it's all lithium ion now, but lithium ions are broader family uh, of battery chemistries. Um, there are a few that dominate um, for electric vehicles. Uh, but they all use lithium, um, you know, and there are good advantages, you know, or a lot of really good reasons for using lithium there. Um, uh, and so a lot of the problems you hear about with, with batteries, um, uh, you know, are due not so much to lithium, but to some of the other, uh, you know, uh, materials that are used, cobalt, for instance. Um, you know, there are really maybe three uh, battery chemistry, lithium ion battery chemistries right now that dominate. Um, to rely heavily on cobalt. And cobalt, you know, is serious problems with sourcing. Most of it comes from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, it's also very toxic to work with. Um, and it just turns out with those battery chemistries too, they're more prone to overheating, to fires, you know, um, um, and other safety problems as well. But they have a lot of, you know, decent advantages. They can store a lot of energy. So they have a high energy density. Um, 
so the this you know the, the, the search is on for other you know uh, uh, metals for battery components that give us the properties we want in a battery, but you know, reduce some of these other problems and some of these other resourcing issues. Um, you mentioned lithium. You know, right now, given current demand for lithium for batteries, you know, we are below um, the mining or mining capacity. Um, so demand today for uh, 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 lithium um, is about 60% of mining capacity. Now, given projections for electric vehicle growth um, and, and battery production, not just for EVs, but also for other forms of you know, uh, storage, grid storage, for instance, that is expected to flip you know, really in the next maybe six or seven years to the point where um, the demand for lithium will outpace the mining capacity you know, by you know, maybe 50%, at least in, under some projections. So that does become significant. Um, and it's not so much a supply issue. The lithium is there, but it's a, you know, it's an environmental issue. And then it's also an economic issue because getting at, getting at some of these other, you know, uh, supplies of lithium um, will cost more. The production costs will go up. In other words, we're, we're going after the cheap sources right now. Um, largely in Australia, where we're extracting lithium through just regular hard rock mining. And then um, in South America, particularly Chile and uh, Argentina, where we're extracting it from, um, well, brines from, you know, kind of salty water. In both those approaches to mining have, you know, significant environmental impacts. Um, but, uh, you know, Again, so the, you know the lithium shortages, you know, or potential lithium shortages, and the environmental impacts of going after lithium, you know, are concerns. But the bigger concerns, I think, are with some of the other materials that are used in batteries, um, in lithium-ion batteries. You know, like I said, cobalt, um, nickel is another one that's mentioned in that context. Um, so, looking at you know the search for different um, battery chemistries that give you what you want, low cost, you know, the ability to store a lot of energy, um, safety, um, the ability to charge very quickly. Um, you know, it, it's you're, you're trying to optimize across those, and there isn't one battery chemistry that gives you all you want. Um, but there's a lot of work being done right now in this area. But just to sum up this, because I, I think I'm rambling, uh, you know. The going beyond lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles right now, you know, there are, you know, so, there are a few options out there, but you know, it really, is, it's lithium ion of some sort. Great, thank you. And I, I realize this is a more general issue with with batteries, a, a wide range of batteries. But um, is there a good disposal method for spent batteries? Is this something environmentalists are working on? It is, and you know, we're not disposing of batteries in quantity right now that it's a problem, but we certainly are looking ahead because this is, this is a big concern. So right now, we recycle about 5% of or, you know, the, the, the lithium-ion batteries that are out there as they near the end of their useful life. And again, lithium-ion batteries show up all over the place, from medical devices to power tools to vehicles to, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, server backups, you know, other grid, grid functions. So there, there's a range of, you know, battery applications. Um, but the problem though with recycling is that, you know, you have so many different types of battery chemistries out there. Um, it's actually hard to design a process, that recycling process that meets, you know, <laughs> that, that can work across different, you know, battery chemistries. They have all sorts of different materials in them. You have to kind of know what's in them before you, you know, do the recycling. So, you know, even if you're going to go invest in a recycling facility that's going to have a you know, reasonably long lifetime, you have to think, okay, what, what are we going to be dealing with in five or 10 years? Um, and that gets complicated. Um, so again, the, the, the disposal numbers are, for the most part, are not, you know, huge, or at least not what we're going to be seeing if we have a lot of, you know, like I say, EV batteries, which are, you know, in quantity can be much greater than what we're, you know, dealing with with electronic devices right now. Great, thank you. Uh, Jen, we had a follow-up question from something we were discussing earlier. Um, so to summarize, electric vehicles rely on power plants, and many power plants rely on fossil fuels. So why do environmentalists favor electric vehicles? Um, and then another, another reporter asked, can we say electric vehicles use X percent less carbon than gas vehicles? 
Could you touch on that again? Ooh, um, so the second question first, I, yeah, I don't think we can say that with any um, certainty right now, um, especially not in a specific area because all of the different regions obviously have different um, carbon components um, to their emissions based on how much renewable energy they have. Um, I will say that, um, you know, as I think one of the reasons that environmentalists are, are, are very um, excited about the opportunity of electrification is that at the same time that we are electrifying things, we are also making it more clean. And so in, in almost across the country, we are seeing you know, additional renewable energy come online um, and reductions through energy efficiency. And so I think that you know, paired together, both the electrification of, tr of transportation at the same time that we are making the, um, our, our power supply more clean or reducing the carbon from it, um, I think those two paired together is, are what the environmentalists get really excited about. Yeah, um, well said. Um, I'll also add that electric vehicles are, electric motors are much, much more efficient than gasoline engines. Um, so with a gasoline engine, maybe 25% of the energy in your gasoline actually goes to turning your wheels. Um, the bulk of it is lost as heat out your radiator or out your tailpipe. With an electric vehicle, you're using more than 90%, 90% so 25 to 90% um, that increase uh, of your energy of electricity to turn, turn your wheels. So they're, they're much, much more efficient in how they use you know, energy uh, you know, to, to move a vehicle. Um, so even if you have emissions tied with the production of the electricity, and you, know, you do, because uh, you, know, you don't have an all you know, entirely renewable grid, of course, um, you know, it's those emissions get spread out over, you know, well, ultimately many, many more miles. And so the, the, the emissions per mile for an electric vehicle will be lower, even if you are, you know, using fossil and, you know, or at least, you know, some proportional fossil energy to generate that electricity. That's interesting. Uh, we have another question from Judith. Uh, what would you say at this moment are the biggest challenges to making electric cars more widespread? If you could do like top three, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can, well, I can go first. Um, it's, it's customer knowledge of the benefits. Um, so this can be either, you know, the, the benefits to a, to a light duty car truck owner, but also to transit buses and heavy duty buses as well. And so I think we have a huge hurdle right now in, in just getting people to test drive and trying things out and, and realizing that they can do their, what they need to do on a daily basis um, with an electric vehicle. I think that's one. I think the second one is um, what I've heard a lot in the light duty space is dealerships right now don't have a lot of electric vehicles on the lots only because it's the chicken and egg. You know, if I, I don't know if I should put them there, if people are going to come buy them or if I should just, you know, buy them as needed. And so I think until we see a lot more of the electric vehicles actually on the lot so that people can test drive them and, and you know, kind of you know, compare them to a traditional um, fuel, fuel um, vehicle, I think we, we have a little bit more of an upward climb. Um, so I know there are a lot of um, ride and drives. I know there are a lot of um, or, you know, organizations that are bringing um, electric vehicles to the workplace so people can test them out while they're at work. Um, and other things like that, I think are gonna be really important to, to getting the penetration that we want for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, yeah, I would have said education being number one, but you know, cost is another, you know, electric vehicles still are more expensive to purchase Although the what's known as the total cost of ownership, but it you know it, it costs you to purchase it and then you know to maintain it and fuel it over the lifetime of that vehicle and for electric vehicle is lower. As again, this is why transit agencies really are hopping on this uh, uh, electric vehicle bandwagon. But for you know an, an individual owner, you know getting over that cost premium hurdle is is significant. And for somebody who's lower income, you know. Um, you know, especially, you know, that, that purchase price, you know, that increase becomes significant. Um, you know, if they're buying a used car, well, there are fewer used electric vehicles out there as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's also, you know, especially for low income people who may be living in, uh, you know, homes or apartments that don't have access to charging or you don't have access, you know, you don't have a place to put in a charger, you know, if it's a rental or you have on-street parking, um, you know, it's not just cost, but then it's access, access to charging as well. Um, I will say, you know, battery trends, you know, the, the cost, the, the cost of batteries, you know, we usually talk about is dollar per kilowatt hour, um, you know, it's the metric you, you, you see uh, cited most often, has come down exponentially over the last decade. Um, 
it's still coming down. You know, the, the magic number there has always been $100 per kilowatt hour. Um, the expectation is batteries for vehicles will drop below that. And you don't have to drop too much below that. And then you'll have price parity between an electric vehicle and a gasoline vehicle at the, you know, at the sticker price parity. You know, they'll, they'll cost roughly the same to purchase because the premium for an electric vehicle um, really is the, the cost of the battery system that's being added to it. Um, and sure, if you're buying a Tesla, you're, you know, there's cachet there you're paying for as well. But you know, leaving that aside, it really is the, the battery cost. And so as battery costs come down and they, they continue to, um, you'll see, begin to see price parity. But you know, that'll help. But again, you know, it, it's, you know, it's charging, ac charging the, you know, access to charging where we started um, is the other significant issue. Mm -hmm. So Tim, you mentioned that, that education is a barrier. If there was one misconception you'd like to correct about electric vehicles, what would that be? Oh, um, probably the range, you know, the range anxiety that just, I'm not gonna be able to charge this. Um, I, you know, I'm gonna have to limit how I drive, where I drive. Um, you know, people, tend to think about the longest trips they take. You know, maybe once a year I take a road trip across country and therefore I need a vehicle that's going to be able to go several hundred miles on a charge um, or on a refueling. Um, but that doesn't reflect everyday driving. Um, you know, again, you know, the, the average commute in the U.S. is well, well below that. Um, but, you know, is well within range of what a you know, typical electric vehicle can do. Um, and so I, I think getting people to think that way, it's also, you know, shift in how we charge. You know, we're used to going to a gas station and filling up in a couple of minutes and, you know, well, electric vehicle won't do that. Um, but, you know, I, so there's a lot we could unpack in that discussion, you know, from especially people, households that have more than one vehicle, you know, well, electric vehicle can probably meet the needs, you know, of a lot of what they do. Um, you know, if they do hang onto a gasoline vehicle for longer trips, now, there, things like that that we, you know, that could bring into this conversation. But um, I think that's, you know, the issue is related to range. Uh, you know, one of the best things to do for people who are skepti skeptical about electric vehicles is to have them sit down and drive one um, because they perform very well. Um, you know, they they accelerate very fast. They handle well. Um, you know, and they're just, you know, nice cars to drive. Thank you. Jen, as an electric car owner, is there anything you'd add there? Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I'm smiling while he's talking because um, the, well, the range anxiety thing, I think I said that up front, but they are fun to drive. And so if there's any myth I would try to bust. It's that they're tedious cars to drive. They are really fun to drive. And, and to Tim's point just now, when someone gets in my, in my car and starts to drive it, they're like, this thing has pickup, this thing can go. Wow, I didn't know that. And so I think if there was any myth I could uh, overcome is that these things can go. I can, I can beat a truck at the, uh, at the stoplight, except for those new F-150s, which are probably gonna beat me now, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a closing question for both panelists. Are there parts of the country or even other countries we can look at for a model on how to do this right with infrastructure for electric vehicles? I can I'll start, start by, yeah, yeah. I, I'll start. In, um, so um, the Northeast has done a really good job of, of getting together um, regionally and, and mapping out where their chargers are, where the chargers are needed, because they recognize that, you know, people don't stay within state boundaries when they travel. And so <clears throat> they've, they've looked at all of their regions and they're strategically placing things. Um, the Western states have also started to do that as well. And so I think just looking to these states that are banding together to, to figure out these corridors, to figure out how to get people out to tourist spots, to figure out the, um, the, the emergency vehicles and the frontline um, communities. Um, I think Northeast and, and the, the Western states come to mind for, for um, areas that we should try to replicate. Thank you. Yeah, I don't, you know, in the U.S. certainly that's, you know, what I would have said as well. Um, other countries, it gets a little bit difficult because we have very different land use patterns and driving expectations, you know, in the U.S. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you could look at, you know, Norway, Denmark, countries like that, but I don't think the comparison with what they're doing is, is apt necessarily. Thank you. Um... I guess we'll go ahead and close. Thanks everyone for joining us. And thanks to our panelists, Tim Johnson and Jen Weiss for sharing your perspectives. This was fascinating. Um, I'd like to add that Duke hosts weekly online media briefings. 
If you'd like to attend the next event, you can email dukenews at duke.edu and uh, don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube. I have to say that. <laughs> In the meantime, please take care of the planet and each other. Thank you.